cup of coffee. <laughs> okay. Ah. Can you hear me okay? I can actually. Yeah. I don't know what happened there. Hello, hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Hello. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. I don't think we've spoken much this week, have we? Did we speak at the beginning of the week? Or... Um, no, we haven't. Um, I can't remember the last time we spoke. It was... Um, I assume it was fairly Grub Street related, but I can't remember when we last spoke. Yeah, I mean, that that's really what I've been working working on and I'm about to sort of go into programming Perda because I've got all the stuff I need now and that just it use uh, it uses a part of your brain that can't communicate with humans <laughs> it's it's uh yeah it's, it's good not, that you have that it's good that you know that easier to warn everybody in advance yeah I don't really like going there to be honest but it's it's uh, got to be done yeah brilliant uh, have you have you been there a few times? Yes. Mm. I mean, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of. <laughs> I I prefer the world, if you see what I mean. I've no, sure, there. yeah, no, I know, I know you do. Um, you can't um, identify Alf Garnet opportunities when you're going to the place where you're about to go. Yeah, well, there aren't any, really. <laughs> yeah. There we are. Mm. So do you want to um, give me a little bit of a snippet into the WordPress experience? Oh, I, I mean, I didn't get too excited about it because um, my, my blog's back up now. Um, and what it was, was um, as part of the process of what i'm going into iop to program okay i want to emerge with a platform that allows bloggers to index their blogs and also can cross reference against federated blogs so i, so I did a post this morning which um links to a blog called the devil's kitchen which is a guy that's been blogging for ages and he's linked into the pete north um who, who is um you know, um, Doctor North's son. Uh, yeah, no, I've had some, I've had some interaction with him. He's a, so, he, he can be pretty good, but he's also a bit of a Nazi. But yeah, well, yes, I I I I, I think you're right. Uh, um, I, I mean, I've, I mean, that's kind of another subject. Um, But, uh, but but it's kind of also kind of relevant in that I've been trying to figure out for ages because I've, I've read most of Richard North's books and I downloaded the other days the ones I hadn't read. So I've now got them on. My, there, are about, there are about three of them which I haven't read. And, and so I now need to read them because, you know, um, I'm very interested in know where he's coming from because in you, mean, you mean you mean you mean the ones with Booker, right? Yes, and the ones he's written on his own. Okay, I didn't know he'd done any on his own, right? Yes, yeah. Um, the most recent one is about the Battle of Britain. Um, but um, I, I, you know, I really have dug into D Dominic Cummings. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We've not had. We haven't discussed that much, but yeah. Well, Pete, Pete North said some very disparaging things about Dominic Cummings. Um, Pete North, Pete North, I have to say, there's something about him that the only term, you know, I mean, you know, unless he's some kind of a complete genius, which I really don't think so, which might give him some sort of license somewhere along the line. I think the word I would describe him using is probably bitch. I don't know why, but um, well, there you go. Uh, yeah. Um... Not very nice of me. 
but um well don't you don't, well, you speak as you're fine so you know if, if, if you feel it say it uh, i mean um that i, I So emotional. He's so emotional. I think it is. I mean, I, I summed up when I with Richard um, North. I, 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 I um, what I came to the conclusion with um, uh, Richard North is that he's a really knowledgeable bloke who is also a know-it-all, and you can have knowledgeable know-it-alls. And and and, and of course, the the maxim goes, or the, the the aphorism is that with knowledge, doubt increases, right? Whereas there is a certain knowledgeable type that becomes a know-it-all, and with them, with doubt, uh, with, with, with them, it, it, doubt does not increase; it decreases. They're, they're convinced of their own rectitude, as it were, and therefore, what tends to happen is because not everybody listens to everything they say and agrees with them. Um, the they have a kind of an egotistical reaction to that, that they don't feel they're being paid enough attention to. And what summed it up best, really, was um, if you look at Richard North's evidence to the um, Treasury Committing, Committee on Leaving the EU, OK, the chairman, before he sort of asked North, he sort of says, um, you weren't able to appear at the committee. We weren't able to have you, you know, before the referendum. And there were various reasons for that. And you published various things saying how stupid we are, that we were censoring you. and We didn't want to speak to you and all of this sort of thing. Um, well, of course, you're here now. And I'd just like to say we very much look forward to hearing what you say, or what you're going to say. Well, of course, he'd thrown his toys out the pram. And he answered to your WordPress thing. What happened with me and WordPress? I didn't throw my my toys out the frat. I thought, well, this is interesting. I'm, I, I, I've got it all backed up. I haven't lost anything. Um, I, I mean, I spent an hour just uh, converting the XML to HTML, which WordPress doesn't make easy. But the reason they do that is so that people can't transfer out of WordPress once they've got you sort of thing. Um, I mean, my blog is already on, on, on Web3. I don't uh, update it often. I mean, I, um, so... Uh, so it was interesting because I one was it censorship, but apparently it was a spam filter. But as I say, this this goes back to what I was saying about um, uh, not throwing your toys out the pram. Um, but the reason I thought it may have been censorship was that as part of this whole process of um making it easy for people on legacy web to get onto web 3 which is what uh, internet open protocol and alexandria on iop is all about and what grub street stroke objective cunts is all about now um the spam filter okay what, what i did was i went into the um uh, open Internet Archive and retrieved a post which was done on Sturdy Blog. Now, you know Sturdy Blog is written by Alex Andronio or whatever, who's a Labour Party activist. A homosexual? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, not that, that, I mean, that doesn't... Uh, no, I'm just using it as a... As a... One is homosexual and the other isn't. It is the homosexual one that has the kabuki theatre doing makeup or, 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 on, on, on Sturdy Blog. Now, he did a fantastic blog back in 2011 called To Whom Do We Owe All This Money? And he was very angry at that time about the Cameron um, government and the austerity measures being brought in and the bank bailouts, etc. And it was actually that blog that took me to Gollum X1V and was the beginning of my friendship with David. OK, there's a comment in the comment section and someone says, oh, look at this over here. They're talking about the same thing. So I went there um, and, and a couple of months after reading David's blog, I commented and, and um, I did a blog. I don't know, last year or the year before, sort of saying from 2009 to 2011, Sturdy and Gollum and, you know, 
really my 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 journey in, in really digging into the financial system um which which led to overdrive after reading alex's blog to whom we owe all this money well that actual entry in his blog is not available on his current blog which is online for some reason he's deleted it and i don't know why that is i think it's odd it is in the wayback machine uh so in the past i've kind of put a link to it and quoted to it but i decided just to cut and paste it into my own blog because um, as part of as part of the process of what I'm doing and indexing blogs and, and what in, what open in, uh, what, what what internet open protocol is and what um, Alexandria is it's a blockchain indexing system and so effectively what it does is it it, 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 it hard codes um, uh, search terms for internet searches for search engines into the blockchain entry attached to um, specific files which then can be recalled off the interplanetary file system um, is, that, I, I, is, that, is that another way of you telling me um, that you are creating more context for things to be found within in a way that um, is going to yeah. be helpful for anyone in the future who might want to have a discussion with people from the past. Yes, including bloggers, writers, researchers, researching from their own research and matching that up to cross-reference across other references. Um, because... I mean, filtering is how our minds work. It's how our senses relate to our sort of own um, consciousness. Without filtering, our consciousness would become overwhelmed. Um, and the Internet is a really overwhelming thing. So um, but effectively, what you don't want is someone else. Putting blinkers on you like some sort of racehorse. Um, what Web3 will allow you to do is to actually design your own blinkers um, rather than have the one size all, fits all set of blinkers, which are designed by um, what we would call it, really, the, the surveillance state, really. The well, surveillance alphabet, isn't it? Alphabet. Well, alphabet, yes. But, but, but I mean, they're really just a big part of, of, of the surveillance state. Looking at Google as a public company is just ridiculous. Uh, in the same way that looking at banks as public, uh, 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 as, 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 you know, private. They're not, they're part of the state. We, we live in state monopoly capitalism and, 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 and Google, Alphabet, Amazon, Uber, all of these so-called unicorns, Tesla. I mean, Tesla is the British Leyland of the 21st century, basically. You know, I mean, it's basically- what? Sorry? The British Leyland of the 21st century. You heard it here first. I mean, I've just um, um If you look at the history of the nationalisation of British Leyland in the 1970s and then think about Tesla, um, you get to a similar place. Uh, a guy that ran um, uh, British Leyland actually went off to North, uh, went off to South Korea uh, to build up. I think it was Kia Motors or, or Maz something. Who did? Uh, the guy who ran British Leyland when it was first... Um, uh, Pride uh, uh, first nationalized. Um, I, I think it's a point. I'll tell you, who makes that point. Um, uh, it's in one of the Adam Curtis documentaries. One of the Adam Curtis, uh, because it's 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 quite an ironic, funny little factoid. Um, but but like I say, I mean Tesla is the British Leyland of the twenty first century. I think that's that's uh, that. You know, all the free market libertarians will quite like that one, I think. But, um, yeah. OK, so. So, so, so in basically, terms of, uh, Richard, it, it, Richard North appears on um, the Treasury Select Committee and they does. say, looking forward to hearing from you. Along with two guys from the WTO and it, it's worth watching.
I did a blog about it the other day, and and and, and the links are on my blog. And there's a and this is this is from this is from two or three years ago. Yes, it's from July two thousand and sixteen, so it's immediately after the referendum. So, and and he launches an attack on Cummings. No, on the same day that he appears, uh, his son. Pete North does a blog in which he says it's interesting that there were no press there to listen to the real experts. And yet there was a huge turnout for all the amateurs like Cummings. So he, he I mean, basically, they're technocrats and self-styled experts. And they don't think that people like me, say generalists or generalists like Cummings, um, are, are really entitled to join the party simply because the... Scarecrow uh, uh, at, at the uh, at the crossroads in the Wizard of Oz uh, was given a diploma, so they've been given their diploma, and their diploma therefore gives them a brain. Um, whereas, you know, more lifelong learning generalists, if you like, um, uh, in their world, are um, have no standing. Um, and, 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 and what's quite interesting, no locus standi, it, 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 um, uh, absent, absentia uh, certification, really, you might put it that way. But, but the, the, the thing is, um, uh, that that is a very, very authoritarian even Prussian way of looking at the world, uh, you know, coming back to your Nazi comment. Um, and then that then comes directly back, back then to Lord Glassman and, 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 and his lecture on uh, authoritarian populism. When's that from? He gave a talk in Jerusalem a couple of years ago. Um, which I found. Um, I, I was very fascinated by the comments that he made um, in, in the film Secret City, uh, sure. which was quoted by Alex Thompson in his AV9 talk on do as of evil things. Um, and he presented this almost as if uh, Glassman was one of the evil ones who had slipped up. Whereas I don't think he did at all. I, I think that he's a libertarian populist as opposed to an authoritarian populist. Um, and what you have with Richard North is an authoritarian uh, who, who doesn't believe in, po in democracy. I mean, I, from reading, um, although will tolerate some at a local level. Um, and I... Looking at... I mean, I, I, I still don't know where he stands, Ranjan. I, I still haven't quite figured him out, which is why I need to read the rest of his books and, and, and just, just put the pieces together. I mean, I, I'd love for him to tell me. So, well, actually, this is where I stand. Because when I read Flexit and when I read, read The Great Deception, which he wrote with um, and, 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 you know, probably halfway through all my reading into him, I, I did my blog on Article 50 and their lordships, and I analysed Flexit, and, 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 and uh, there, there are two huge lacunae in the North thesis. One is money creation, the money power, and two is military unification and military alliances such as NATO. Um, and uh, the thing is, you can't understand the world without understanding those two things as well and that he leaves it out of his analysis um i i mean i say he's either done it by omission or through ignorance and as he strikes me as anything but an ignorant man he's obviously a very intelligent guy well, I, I, the, on I balance think, ability left it out on purpose well i think the man is obsessed with i mean between them i think they are obsessed with world war Two. Um, although they don't, you know, and um, also the stuff to do with bureaucracy and trading services and things like that. I think mm. they go there, but for some reason, I don't think they talk about the European Central Bank very much. No, they don't at all. Do you know what it is, uh, Ranjan? 
when I was in business, I was in business with a lot of academics and actually quite a lot of academic economists and game theorists. And um, we all fell out and ended up in a massive high court case. They all sued me for 12 million quid. And um, uh, you built or something? Uh, well, we won. I mean, they did it twice and we won both times. They tried to sue us in the States as well, but, but there was no um, the court had no standing there. But the, the point was that, that um, uh, what I used to say about them was this, is that um, uh, there was a big boardroom row. And, and, and one of them said she was an assistant professor who was uh, uh, the girlfriend of, of one of my partners. And she said, well, the thing about you, Roger, you're not prepared to submit yourself to peer review. And I said, well, the thing is, Rachel, this is you're not my peers. I said, I would submit myself to peer review, but to think of yourselves as my peers is complete nonsense. I said, the problem is with you lot is you get involved in a few successful property deals and then you all think you're fucking Donald Trump. And that is the problem with these bureaucrats that think they're doing trade deals that somehow enhance trade. Well, that is not what trade deals are for. What they're for are for queering the pitch, for tilting the tables. Um, it, it, that's, that's what they do. And, and it became quite clear to me the other day, um, looking at um, North okay, giving his essay, right? And he's talking about the single market. And he said, oh, it's very difficult with the single market, he said, to, to describe it, because with the single market, you're either in it or you're not. Um, but of course, if you're not in it, you still have access to the people that are in it just on different terms. Now, that is a perfect description of mercantile protectionism. And that is effectively what I think he is. He's a mercantile protectionist, but he doesn't think the EU do it well enough. And his view is that we could do it much better in Britain and possibly in Britain as Atlanticists with the USA. And, and that is, I think, what his position is. Um, but as I say, like I said to, you know, investors in my old company, you know, I, I will not subject myself to peer review by you lot because you simply are not my peers. You know, we, we, we've had a successful business and now you all think you're Donald Trump. I'm fucking Donald Trump. You're not Donald Trump because I can do it without you. You can't do it without me. Um, and at that point, I didn't need their money anymore either for, in terms of the initial capital being invested. And that is the sort of microcosm of how the system works and how privileged trustafarians who know nothing that couldn't negotiate their way out of a paper bag are now running things. Um, and, and so that's the it's the point of privileged middlemen as well. Uh, and, and again, this is where um, objective Kuntz, um, Grub Street, Alexandria, Web3 comes in. What, what, what it actually does is it puts um, wealth creators and um, people who create matter of interest to other people that they are prepared to exchange their value for. Um, it allows value exchange between value creators. Um, absent the middlemen, including the government, including supranational organisations who seek to impose trade deals over these tiresome people who insist on doing things which add value. And that, that's, that's, you know, in its essence, that is also what, what the internet has become in terms of the monopolization of points of entry. Now, an interesting thing, coming from Cummings the other day, he, he's done a really interesting blog, which effectively criticizes people like Richard North, and Richard North criticizes people like Dominic Cummings. Well, I'm on the side of Dominic Cummings. I'm not on the side of Richard North. 
I, I appreciate and 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 uh, respect his knowledge on on the EU, its institutions, and world institutions for basically interfering with free trade. <laughs> okay, so you know, but but he's part of the problem. He's nowhere is he part. Of, he, he he he's he, he's one of the authors of the problem, um, and expecting him to author the solution um, is is in my terms rather naive. Now. But Cummings, on the other hand, um, I think he understands the problem that all those people have. But his latest blog, OK, links to a uh, chi American Chinese physicist uh, by the name of Su, uh, T-S-U or S-S-J-U or something. Anyway, uh, he wrote a very recent blog, a very short blog, talking about what the tech oligarchy has in store for us and it's beautiful it's very on point it's only three paragraphs um and it sums up the whole problem of um the tyranny of the nerds okay now the tyranny with, of with cummings i tend to I, I part company with him in that i think that he 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 hasn't got to a stage where he realizes what a complete clusterfuck a tyranny of the nerds would actually be so, um, yeah, effectively, um, you know, the constituencies need to figure out what they're good at and how what they're good at can be enhanced by the skill sets of those other people. Um, and, and in the polarised world that we're currently living in, nobody is prepared to recognise uh, the value added from people who who on the face of it have opposing skill sets, but actually these skill sets are symbiotic uh, and um, uh, effectively um, as the factions are split into skill sets and they all want to be king of the castle, there's a huge degradation going on because nobody's prepared to listen to each other and improve basically the, the, the final outcome. Okay, so at this at this stage, what I'm taking away, topic wise, is that you're talking about trade deals, tech nerd oligarchs, mm -hmm. and something about the role of information and choice, the limiting of information and choice. One, in terms of let's say you talk about something and you blog it then what are the chances anyone will ever notice it today or tomorrow? And you're talking about creating a system in which people who comment on things in some sort of a context have that context respected in the future, however much things may change, so that people have some chance of uh, identifying that information and possibly interrogating it. And that the barriers that are there that prevent that type of thing from happening something to do with expertise and status but also just simply um it's difficult to find it yeah well, because, and it's, because it's, also, it's not being constructed to be easy to find it's also to do with the huge um huge hoarding of revenues at the very very peak of the of, of the pyramid um I mean, we're not talking about a bell curve distribution here. What we're talking about is uh, a massive spike and an infinitely long tail. And most of us live in that infinitely long tail, which never gets a look into earning any revenue. Um, and the point sure. is, the, the point is that more and more people are going to be contributing to the global consciousness through the internet, whether it's through social networks, whether it's through uh, things like old message boards on specific um, scientific and social problems. Um, and the point is about this, this discourse um, is, is the internet and the interactions that it, between it, um, if money is the sum of social relations in a uh, society but it's also an expression of the surplus energy in a society when it is expressed as 
uh, prosperity. Prosperity is surplus energy available to any society. And then the third part of that then becomes um, if you want to ensure that the health of that society and that discourse continues healthily, um, then what the internet becomes is the distribution system through which value created by people who interact becomes distributed. And the distributed internet is the way of doing that. The legacy internet, the server-based model, and even the cloud-based model privileges the oligarchical technocrats in the pinch points. They become like the islands off the coast of markets. But um, can I just can I can I just um, chip in here because I am listening, and the question for me is um, from a sort of epistemology or epistophilia. But then I think we're talking about the monetizing or, or not the monetizability or not of epistophilia you know do people like knowledge is there profit to be made from liking knowledge and if there is no profit to be made from giving people access to knowledge then no. there's no encouragement that's yeah. before you even start talking about censoring it, so, it's it's not even about it's it's not about profit and loss okay that no but when i say that what i mean is incentive what is the incentive for the tech oligarchy to structure unstructured information in such a way as to facilitate transfer of knowledge between people who seek it, well, which is the very opposite of what they're doing well, they, now? They won't, which is why we're doing it without them. No, sure they won't. But uh, can and, you understand, you understand and, why I'm asking that question? Um, but... but the simple fact is you have centralized top-down authoritarian um, systems and then you have democratic systems okay and then you have various points in between and we are tending very much towards outright tyranny and the divine right of kings and absolute chosenness um, we're tending much more to that side of things than we are to the side of the rights of man um, and each man, uh, you know, born uh, with the right to, you know, wealth, pursuit of happiness and all of those ideals expressed in the American Constitution um, and, and, and other, ev more or less every other constitution that's come since. And people, as soon as they write these things, they put them in the drawer, rather like we used to put um, construction contracts in the drawer. Um, and it, it used to happen every time. Whenever I signed a construction contract, with the builder, the, the, the managing director would usually say, right, OK, now that side, we'll put it in the drawer and we will hope not to see that again. And I think, oh, yes, bloody right. You know, that that's um, uh, half the time. They, 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 the clauses which they wouldn't remove from contracts were precisely the ones they hoped to, use to, to, to basically game the whole process uh, after you you you'd committed to a contract with them and this is this is the this is the whole point about the system that we live under it, it's it's a system which on game theory uh, where the iterations coming out the other end are are are, are supposed to be self-fulfilling prophecies which um basically gives with one hand and takes back uh what is given with interest with the other uh, which basically means everything and it come in the future ends up back in the same small group of hands and so and that's what trade deals actually um uh end up doing uh, and this idea you know trade deals politicians um mandarins bureaucrats these people do not create wealth these people do not um, uh, create activity and enable, you know, jobs and employment or all the rest of it. They simply do not. They stand in the way of it. 
the point of that regulation is to even up uh, and, and, and get away from massively centralized power. Um, and, and the massively centralized power that we have at the moment is basically because of the total misunderstanding of how business works by bureaucrats because they all think might is right and they they equate success with um actually having understood and, and, and played by the rules and, and and in most cases it's precisely the opposite um and so you know light tight touch regulation okay which is gordon brown's thing with the city it's complete nonsense i mean basically if something shouldn't be happening and you don't want to happen you make damn sure it doesn't happen right you don't pussyfoot about it or get lobbied about it so if you don't want people to pollute okay if they do pollute they're out of business it's as simple as that you don't have carbon trading you don't have ngos and all the rest of it sort of trying to demonize something that isn't even to blame i.e carbon dioxide what you actually do is you say if you damage the living environment around your plant you will pay if you are union carbide in bhopal in india and you murder through your own negligence a huge number of people that live around that plant then you are out of business that is it end of story so, so do you see what i'm saying um these these people that do these trade deals and all the rest of it what they're trying to do is 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 fake privilege into the cake going forward for basically the ruling party and and um that there you have it that's that, that that's it and people like richard north and people like peter north um are kind of sycophants to that sort of system but they, mm. they are the pets of one set or other of, of the oligarchy and i haven't quite figured out whose pet he is as yet but pet he is i'm sure yeah i'm glad that you've um sort of said that because it's something which i'm quite comfortable with just you know instinctively and that's mm -hmm. as someone who has looked at their stuff and wanted to really like it you know there is so much about it as you said that i found appealing to common sense in so many ways and and i believed but you know, Wittgenstein said it best. I, I think um, Wittgenstein said about one of his books, um, the book you want to read is not the book I've written. You know, what, what's important in my book is not what's in the book, it's what isn't in it. Um, and what isn't in it is actually something which, you know, simply is beyond understanding. And, and you know, so as far as it goes, flags it, the great deception, all the rest of it, yeah, they're great pieces of work, but uh, they say more for what they don't say than what they do say. That's my view. Mm. And it would be whipping side's view as well, I'm sure. Sure, sure. Well, Roger, so um, what's the latest then? Um, I'm thinking in terms of what I'm doing, as I've probably told you, I teach English as a foreign language, but I haven't been doing that very much lately. And this is the time but when it's you about that, Ranjan. It's just the other day it was suggested me, to me that perhaps I should take on Chinese business students and teach them English and that I could actually earn a living online doing that. I mean, if you've been doing that, how are you finding that? Yeah, I mean, I don't do it much. But to be honest, if you wanted to, because I know that I sometimes see at the bottom of your blog post, you sometimes say, you know, will work, you know, yeah, will work. work for food. I mean, uh, you know, I, I am brother. Can you spare a dime, man? That's for sure. OK, so here's what here's what I'm thinking. OK, if you wanted to do mm -hmm. this, here's a business that I'd be really interested in doing and getting your take on it. And obviously, you know, as you are a business person, which is probably a good thing for me, um, we could take things down a sort of results orientated uh, approach. But um, the notes that I've made today, um, language learners, mm -hmm. they find it. So if you look at the metaphor of the computer and the brain, this is never, ever going to run out of legs. Mm -hmm. right? It's, you know, permanently, if you're talking to a language learner, 
um, about their ability to retain vocabulary or identify that you know there are different word orders that could be employed some of which actually work immediately some mm -hmm. of which they've made up based on their mother tongue um that the metaphor of the computer in the brain is just always going to be there you know it, it doesn't work switch it back on you know do this do that so then when it comes to giving people raising people's awareness of what their cognitive processes are so that they're not just doing it subconsciously i mean a way to learn very slowly is to allow it to all happen subconsciously mm -hmm. uh, a way to sort of accelerate it is to consciously examine that which you would long term do subconsciously because then you're just sort of jumping the curve a bit so what i'm thinking is have you ever heard of gerd gigerenza i uh, you've mentioned to him my, before yeah, gerd gigerenza was the inspiration behind the dog and the frisbee by andy haldane at the bank of england around 2011 but this is the school of um not behavioral economics but it's that school of economics that talks about it's actually the opposite of behavioral economics behavioral economics is kind of uh, we're predictably irrational, you know, we make all these really obvious mistakes. But the other one says we know far more than we know we know. And the example that Gerd Gigerenza likes to give. So this is all this is all about failure friendly societies in order to be permanently improving. And so the example they give is if we really are all rational. So the person that they're really attacking, I think they're attacking the nudge people, which is Lakoff and Thaler and Sunstein and uh, Obama and everything to do with that and how to win arguments in that way by listening to someone and then just kind of doing a weird thing you know agreeing with them and doing a weird thing um, they're against all of that and they're also against Danny Kahneman and um, all of the behavioral uh, economics people and I think what they say is for example if you are a baseball player or a cricketer uh, let's say you're in the slips and um, you know fast bowler comes in it nicks the bat and before you've even realized what's going on, you've caught the ball. Mm -hmm. um, so not arithmetically, I suppose you would say mathematically to do that, you would have to conduct a series of differential equations at speed. And as an expert, you do that without thinking. Mm -hmm. And this goes against the Danny Kahneman claim, which is the only reason why anybody gets anything wrong is because they don't have enough knowledge and they don't have enough time. And um, what these guys are saying, yeah, but if you're an expert and you're well schooled at something, which could be catching a ball, for example, then, you know, the last thing you want is time. And the last thing you need is more information because you have developed this instinct to in, in, on tiny opportunity, tiny information, go bang like that. In a book on memory that I once read, which I strongly recommend, which was called Moonwalking with Einstein. Uh, where they managed to secure a mini interview with Tony Buzan, the guy behind the memory championships, which is a cult in itself, not necessarily bad. Um, and um, what's his name? That guy, Madsen Par Par Parry, the one from the Institute of Economic Affairs and Adam Smith. He's a St. Andrews Mensa guy. But one of the things that they say in that is when they talk about memory and how to improve it and the tricks that are out there, one of the things they talk about is chess strategy. They say chess strategy isn't always about intelligence. Often it's about memory. That's why the more you've played, you know, so long as you've got, you know, healthy diet, etc., the more muscle memory you've got to rely on. Well, muscle then, memory is the thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then they talk about um, something which I'd heard of before. And it sounds so random, but it obviously exists. And I happen to have weirdly somehow heard of it. Maybe one of my students told me she was interested in it. But mm -hmm. um, I heard that one of the highest paid jobs out there um, in the same way that you've got airline pilot, apparently in Korea, it's a chick sex checker where you have a very limited amount of time. You have a bunch of little chicks and you have to grab the chick. It's tiny. You've got to grab it in your two fingers, pull it up, go like that and then put it in male or female conveyor belt. So apparently the sex checker, the Korean sex checker of chicks um has to have a very I very you're going to describe something like the new tinder then <laughs> yeah exactly uh, for the, the the bot tinder exactly uh, the body uh, so the body checker but yeah so they've got to they've got to identify if it's male or female in mm -hmm. no time at all and they have to have a very low failure rate 
And apparently mm-hmm. that is actually to do with memory. Uh, even though it's either male or female, I mean, apparently you just get better at that, but you don't think, you know, you just, you, it's yeah. a factory. So it's that type of thinking that I'm hoping to take advantage of in order to create some kind of high paced activities, possibly starting off as board games in the physical before then possibly going in. A, a, an evolution of the idea of immersive learning, um, you know, i.e. throwing in the deep end. Like here, when they teach English in, 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 in Sweden, in SFO, everybody speaks Swedish all the time. Um, and, you know, there's no English is spoken or any other language. Though, and considering lots of people don't even speak English and everyone's there to learn Swedish, that makes a lot of sense. But immersive learning it is, you know, it's learning by doing. Um, and... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think that's, that's, that's right. Different people learn differently, though. Um, and I think the important part is uh, the framework of understanding. Now, Chomsky, a linguist, as you know, um, was quite f- famous for actually talking about the Internet in terms of frameworks of understanding. And even to do immersive le- learning, OK, um, it's important to have some sort of framework and it may be a different framework for different types of people all in the same class because when they're immersively learning the things that they're learning need to be hung on to the framework obviously with language if it's a particular language part of that framework needs to be the grammar and the syntax and the, the sentence construction and all that sort of thing um, to get away from immersive uh, language learning and the point you made earlier about people having sentence structure or word order based on how it would be in their mother tongue as opposed to how it is in, say, the target learning language. Yeah, so Uh, that is the as is to hmm. me. You know, this is how I would do it. And this is where I'm going. Here are the options of where I could have the shit land on the wall when I throw it. Yes. Uh, And so the other metaphor is Tetris. Um, and, and going back to what you were saying about Chomsky and frameworks of understanding, uh, there's a Danish education theorist that I came across once a few years ago. His name is Nud Illeris, as in Knud Illeris, K-N-U-D space I-L-L-E-R-I-S. He came up with something which I think was called three-dimensional learning in the early 90s. You may have come up with it a long time before, but that's when apparently he published it. Um, and he says that, for example... Let's say we talk about the idea of two plus two Mm -hmm. and you're, let's say, somewhere between nine and 15 years old, two plus two. So you walk into the room and and, uh, obviously you should already know this, but, you know, I say, oh, two plus two. So question number one, there are three questions here. One, cognitively, can you handle this? You know, do you have enough brain power or whatever to be able to take this in? Two, how do you feel in the room in terms of the temperature, the smell? how irritating the people are around you, how comfortable are you? So one is in the mind. The other one is in the immediate environment, your sense of belonging there. Mm -hmm. And then the third was, can you apply whatever it is that's being discussed to anything outside the room? So Mm -hmm. do you have brain power to take it in? Uh, Am I in a safe environment now? And then the idea of if I had two bananas and I had another two bananas, you know, am I comfortable with the idea that there is a significance to that being four or whether that be shipping or something like that? So what they're saying is, can you apply this to the world outside your mind and outside the room? And apparently that's one of the things that separates animals from humans is that ability to apply a principle in another place mm-hmm. with with really not too much thinking required yeah. uh, to do yeah. the transfer. So yeah. those principles that I kind of identified uh, because they were pointed out to me by reading or from classes that I did, but I'd already done some teaching and realized where I was good, where I was bad, where my students were good, or how they were reacting to what I was doing. So what I'm thinking is this, um, Mm -hmm. to create uh, rapid reaction, um, a bit like Have I Got News For You, games where we take the bits on social media that blogs and newspapers are prepared to share for free, Mm -hmm. such as headlines and blurbs Mm -hmm. and possibly even first paragraphs. They give all that shit away for free because what are they advertising? The first rule of PR is protect PR. 
So they're always protecting their own by showing the parade of stuff like that. So that stuff isn't going to be very deeply paywalled because you could probably get those three things mm -hmm. as part of the teaser rate before you get the subscription, mm -hmm. even if it's something free like The Guardian. So I thought a way of repurposing, monetizing, operationalizing those yeah. things, because that's yeah. the shop window. Yeah, you've um, got to, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how I pray does. That's what the flow blockchain does. That, that's what goes in the metadata. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so and so then and then it becomes a yeah. case of creating context, as you were saying before, in advance of somebody taking in that feed and then yeah. afterwards creating activities that they could do. The activities are drag and drop. Yeah, these are the age old, you know, like fucking, mm -hmm. you know, monkeys drag and drop gap fill. And it's about permutation. Tetris is about limited time and only a few options. But you can make them look really dramatic by saying, well, where's it going to go? Where's it going to go? And in your mind, you're doing that. You know what the subject is. You know what the keywords are. But can you identify which prepositions are missing, where to put them, whether you don't need one, and whether it's a definite article or a pronoun? So really, for me, you've got small words and big words. Big words are things like the subjects. The small words are what connects them. And so that's the kind of Tetris thing with the underlying. And it's mm. just about getting people. So the words are, may I ca carry on? I'm just about yeah, to finish. Yeah, I'm really, really um, fascinated. Keep going. Um, yeah. So we call it lexical analysis. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, if you have the word smoker, in French, it's fumeur, fumatore, fumador. You have different ways of saying the word smoker. It's the same mm. word. So most people will uh, transliterate a sentence from their own language and then put the word smoker in their own order. But if you went to a party and you sat next to someone and they smoked again and again and again and again and again, you could say yesterday I went to a party and I smoked down with someone who smoked a cigarette and then another one and then another and then another. You could say and then another many times. You could also say I went to a party and sat next to a chain smoker. Mm -hmm. And that link between the word chain and smoker, heavy, non dope, passive, mm -hmm. weed, uh, shisha, all of these words combined with smoker. So my chemistry wasn't that good. But I mean, I think you had that thing. It wasn't valency, but it was to do with potential to combine that ability to combine with something to do with the shells and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's really to do with how willing a word is to reciprocate an energy with another one. And mm -hmm. so then you have the word in this field that's called lexical analysis or a, a way of looking at things. You have what's called the collocation. And so what I say is to my students, you're used to learning vertical lists of words. Mm -hmm. Dog, chien, cat, chat, le chat, this, that, yeah. this, that. But that's OK when you're just learning a few words and you don't know anything. But then when you have to utter sentences, it's not about vertical. It's about horizontal. And you need to identify the horizontal behavior. What's in the neighborhood? If you're going to say the word smoker, you're pretty likely to either say non heavy chain or, mm. you know, dope. So then afterwards, it's about categorizing. So what I want to do is I want to raise collocational awareness. Mm -hmm. um, so if I see a headline and a blurb and I see a collocation, it's very important to be able to say, here are alternative collocations that could be used. So mm -hmm. now you're really learning how to use that word. You don't know how mm -hmm. to translate it. You know how to fucking use it. Yeah. Um, and then that's with one word. But then afterwards, let's say you say um, the word raise. You've got raise your game and you've got raise the stakes. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then afterwards, you've got prepositions. So with prepositions, it's uh, I'll see you up there or I'll see you in a minute. So see and minute, you know, in and up there. So when you have a verb and it has a noun, often you have see these syntactic formalities such as prepositions and articles. And that, so these are the kinds of things, the small words. When I first started teaching, I would say, are there any words you don't recognize? Well, they were never going to tell me a small word, but they don't know where to put them if they have to reproduce. So in the journey from input to output, it's not fair for me to ask them to analyze reading input and look for the complicated bits because they don't recognize that, you know, they don't have the insight to do the to do the output correctly. So these are the kinds of things that could help gamify headlines, blurbs and first paragraphs. And whether I did that in a board game sense at the beginning for the physical 
to say, come on then, bam, bam, bam. So you're saying matching. You know, that's before the challenge starts. But then you've got the deeper level where you're talking about the raising the colligational awareness. Mm. And then the last of all, because I came across three ideas from a guy called Michael Hoey from the University of Liverpool, who I think decided to learn Swedish. And he said, uh, I've, I'm very bad at Swedish and I'm proud of being bad at Swedish because if it weren't for the fact that I'm recently crap at Swedish, despite, you know, a few years of doing it, then I wouldn't be able to call myself a language learner, which helps me get in the psychology of whoever it is that I'm trying to help. So he said, collocation, colligation, which is the link between the preposition, the, the verb and the noun is going to have prepositions and articles in between. So that's colligation. You know, I'll see you in a minute. I'll see you up there. It's the in and the up. Um, and then the last one, you'll love this one. I love this one. He used the word because I know you're into your poetry and you're into computer programming. So semantic prosody. Um, so it is the energy contained within a word that indicates the degree to which it is happy or sad, to mm -hmm. which it is upbeat or kind of. Uh. And the way I like to describe so what, it is, is that a play on reciprocity? Uh, Sem prosody. Semantic prosody is this. It's the, so it's the meaningful rhythm in a word. So basically, he says, for example, and this is all from corpus linguistics. Only after a while did they have enough corpora to be able to statistically analyze where words were going within the context that they were. So the word situation mm -hmm. in Spanish, if you work in a bank as an English teacher and you say, oh, what's going on? They'll say, well, la situación económica en, en, en España es así, blah, blah, blah. So they'd mm -hmm. say the economic situation, but we would just say the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the large difference is that if we say situation in English, it is without exception, it is always bad. If you say, what's the situation? You mean, it's an emergency. Where are we? Um, and so semantic prosody is that. And that's not an easy thing for language learners to immediately pick up at the moment because they're not always told the context. It goes back to your Grub Street context indexing. They're not told the context of what they're doing. So they're given a gun, but they're not told it's a gun and they don't know which way it's pointing. Yeah. So they certainly don't know where to point it themselves in the future, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, so those are the principles, collocation, colligation, semantic prosody, as well as those other gigarenza type things to do mm -hmm. with, you know, us knowing more than we know. And so yeah. giving people the opportunity to do rapid fire things via an app, rapid rebuttal. So mm -hmm. people like, you know, whoever wants to work on it are able to grab the headlines from whichever sector it is that mm -hmm. people have customized, yeah. you know, whether it's financial yeah. services or politics. Yeah. OK. Indexing Wikipedia with SQL interrogation works well with this. I mean, I, I fannied about a few years ago. Uh, do you remember when um, people were pl playing on their phones that kept collecting Pookachons or whatever they're called? Do you remember Pokemon? That? Pokemon, yeah. And I was thinking, what a complete waste of time. But a Pokemon game which actually used Wikipedia SQL searches, right? You could, you could attach that to location and you could attach it to language learning because what you would do is, you know, when you go around a museum and you get those great things where you can listen at different points and you put in the number and it says what you want to do. Well, well I, don't, I don't know about that, but I told you about um, going to the Museo Donna Pamphili and listening to the audio, which I loved, where the guy talked about nepotism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those things, I love that. I, I mean, I like going to museums and those things. I, I, I think they're great. But when the first thing I thought when I saw my kids wanting to play that Pokemon game with their things was because I'd, I'd actually um, there's a wonderful um, thing that was done about mapping philosophy. I did a blog about it a, a few years back, mapping philosophy. And then I did another one called uh, um, uh, which was about uh, listening to Brexit. And there's a computer scientist that looked at the Twitter analytics and mapped them. And this other guy mapped the indexing to the philosophy portal in Wikipedia uh, by which were the important and not so important philosophers. So the philosophers was links going out and in. So that would be the, um, uh, the co-location you know, of them. 
the more links, the more influence. Um, and uh, so, oh, okay, so so you mean so, so you mean the more so links, mean the more people linked to the page, and the more links that were in the page. Yes, uh, and and so you can see who's linked to who, and then the most important ones end up with the biggest blob, and that's the way that these. Uh, that's the way SQL works when you actually graph it, right? Sorry, I have to go off now. Sorry, to all right. Do. Yeah. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye. See you later. I'm, I'm taking the kids out for the day. So okay, cool. Go. See ya. Bye. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but in terms of a language game, okay, um, this is where con context, learning in context, deep immersive learning, yeah? So, you you can be learning the language all the time with a context game that's linked to wikipedia because wikipedia articles are also linked or even youtube videos you can actually put your location uh, in 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 google and google maps right and as handheld phones are basically satellite navigation uh spying devices you can actually use that for a positive end and so um say you want to practice your english and you're sat there waiting for a bus on the king's road or something and you're opposite chelsea barracks right and you're a language learner oh what's that building it, it can come up on wikipedia on your phone and it can extract from that the language within that article relevant to the to where you're up to in the game and that can all happen in an instance with um you can do that with pro programming and with uh index databases that can happen with the web as it exists i mean that that you know it's already done i mean it, it, it's easy it's not easy to do it's fucking hard to do but it is doable you, you can train people to you know to do it well, i mean for example myself if i were to take the position of the crap spanish uh, swedish speaker um mm. for, for someone like myself to be able to do that in either german russian chinese arabic mm. to, to have that tool to, you know to be dropped virtual reality you know i'd like to do it on google maps for my own living room to, to well, go it, to, I mean, to, to i like google translate as well and and um in twitter i have loads of foreign language feeds in my twitter i can't read all day i can't read russian but it will translate it i can't read um uh farsi but i can read iranian tweets because i just press translate and you know arabic uh, uh, you know greek uh, all of these things uh, and matching Google Translate to these things. And so this is the other thing you see with a language learner. Uh, with me, when I'm doing Swedish or whatever, I mean, I, I can read Swedish much better than I can speak it. Uh, but but what I what I do find um, is. You, have you ever watched a foreign language film with the, with the subtitles on that sort of thing, even foreign language? videos with english subtitles in youtube uh the etimov one i've got on my channel uh, it wasn't up someone hadn't enabled the language learning so i downloaded it uploaded it and just put the you know the, the subtitles and so so it would do it um and it's like a two-hour video which is really worth watching but it was only available in russian apart from part a, a, a very small part of it someone has hold done on, that hold on did you just tell me that there was a Russian language film and you downloaded something that manufactured the translations in English? Yes. No way. So it, it listened, it listened to that. YouTube already does that. It, it already works. You, it, it's already doable. It's just not always un enabled and it's not enabled on all videos. So For instance, so, so I'm, record, I'm recording this. I could upload this and ask for it to be subtitled in French. Yes. I didn't know that. And there are commercial programs that do it really, really well, but they cost money. But you can do it for free with a few workarounds on, on, on using, using YouTube. And I, and I have well, done. OK, well, well, going back to um, so let's pretend. OK, mm -hmm. I mean, I quite like this. Obviously, there's a enormous amount of tongue in cheek here. I, I assume you know that. But um, either way, 
let us pretend I am the boss. Okay. And I'm there saying, by the way, I'm enjoying this form of role play already. <laughs> so I say, um, dear Minion, um, a.k.a. Professor Roger Lewis, um, I say, Roger, I want you to construct me a money machine. Um, I want it to look a little bit like this and basically say, you know, let us get humans into uh language learning by identifying what their obsessions are mm -hmm. so start off with one you know you could have something like football you could have something like fashion you could have, have something like music or finance or whatever it is chatting then, up girls yeah exactly so yeah. but it's quite good to get something where they can mix <laughs> their, exactly you can you, so something where they could mix their um, sense of humour, as you <laughs> said, you know, their own. But it's all about competition and really wanting to play a game live and direct. And if you can harness that type of thing, then they just want more and they'll be obsessed with it. But they'll absorb it so much that it's just a part of their character that yeah. you're taking advantage of. So whether that be something that's being heavily marketed, I mean, the thing is, you don't want to be too much part of the problem but let's say it's just to do with financial news you know there's a permanent mm. stream of it mm. you know and, and behind it we could say listen there is such a thing as the oligarchy mm. you know things are happening but for now let's just uh, watch the stories mm. and so create opportunities to talk about things and then permanently be feeding them the, the latest vocabulary and stuff like that I mean it's just it's just a way of getting started what because once you've got their loyalty it's just a case of you know what I mean uh, I, I when I was a kid I used to watch Sesame Street, and Sesame Same Street here. used to do all this stuff. Yeah, you know, I, it's um, and you know, and it works. The the other um, there's a wonderful system for teaching music, and I did a blog about this. A wonderful woman um, who who invented this system of teaching music, reading music, learning music, understanding the components of of, of music and oh, yeah. music education. And it was a colour based learning system and the music education establishment hated her. They absolutely hated her. And, and it was ad adopted in a region of Essex that used her system. You would expect this woman to be world famous and worldwide. But what she explained it herself and she said, well, actually, the, the music establishment didn't like me for doing it because, you know, they felt they'd served their time. They'd done their period of pain getting their head around this sort of really complicated way of doing things here's me you know she kept it worked what she did worked but it didn't conform with the idea of you've got to sit there uh play your scales and if you get them wrong be wrapped over the knuckles by a ruler it wasn't that kind of teaching um there are there are videos of her on youtube her name escapes me at the moment but 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 um it's a perfect example of how uh, immersive learning and learning by doing and actually using uh, a set of references which are outside of the abstract academic type references which um, effectively it's a way of making uh, making empirical knowledge esoteric if you think of it that way and so academia all its jargons even Greek notation in, say, algebra um, and calculus and what have you. It's a way of making the perfectly bleeding obvious esoteric. Um, and the reason um, they're such powerful tools. And so the job of the educational establishment is to actually put people off even thinking about learning them. I'm convinced that's part of what maths education in school and science education is good. It's to put most people off. I, I'm absolutely convinced of it. Um, and yeah, sure, sure. Um, I came across a book a few years ago called Designing Significant Learner Experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about user experience, then I think one of the things is that a learner could either be in a classroom with 24 other people, uh, with two or one other pe person, or at home. Mm -hmm. And um, at home, it could be like Coursera, where they're watching a video, but also you could have it where you put some activities in. 
So mm. I started paying for this thing called Adobe Captivate. And I think I've paid for it for nearly two years. And I haven't really used it much because I'm so easily distracted. Uh, and the thing is, with that, what happens is you use it. Um, but if you want to get anyone to actually use it as a student, mm -hmm. then you have to pay $5 a month for each one of them, mm -hmm. which would mean, obviously, you're charging them more than that yourself. Yeah. Um, but I would like to find a learning software. And what does Adobe Captivate do then? Well, I think it's like Coursera. It allows you to play a video and then give a multiple choice question. Uh huh. And then afterwards get the marks. I mean, because what we could do, for example, is you could um, create some uh, content, some videos, some activities, and at the end, it get they get marks out of ten. You know, all that type of stuff. You can watch well, when they did like it. Quizzes. People like right. quizzes. They like crosswords. They like Sudoku. Exactly. So by doing, by incentivizing them with that type of competitive game, mm -hmm. where they're competing against themselves, but you can also, like a Fitbit, get them to compete against their family and each other. And if you start going to places like Manila, Bogota, where you're basically saying, here is a video of Elon Musk, um, mm -hmm. who is the Leyland of the, not, you know, the 21st century. No, you don't say that. But you say, here is, here is, here is, a, here is a Elon Musk, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, you just give the latest on these people. And mm -hmm. then you create, it's a combination between Have I Got News For You and Tetris. Uh, mm -hmm. except as a result, you could also give them a little bit of some type of crypto so that they can um, measure themselves off against each other and feel like they're, you know, like it's all, you know, gathering pace and get them to do more and more and more. Yeah, I mean, that's that's how Steam it works with what they call proof, proof of brain. I mean, the best thing about Steam it is just that bit of the white paper where they talk about proof of brain. Oh, really? Yeah, the rest. I mean, I, I I'm not a big fan of Steam it in general, but that part of the white paper I think is very very good. Um, but what it is 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 this this thing that I always keep coming back to it is um, people trying to think in a centralized monopolistic way in a distributed system uh, eco system, right? It it, it just in me. It provokes abject horror, you know. Uh, it, 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 and it's it, it, it's in a repulsive kind of way. It's not the kind of an incongruence that makes you laugh, you know. It's not a comedic incongruence. It's an evil one, you know. Well, what you just said reminds me of um, you could say of the, you know, the Reformation you know, with printing and all of that and the dissolution uh, and the parallel with the creation of Buddhism mm -hmm. as a reaction to the Brahmin caste using Sanskrit everywhere. And basically people saying, fuck, you know, come on, when's it our turn? When do we get to participate, um, you know, and, and share in the creation of this as opposed to just having it handed to us? And it feels like, you know, that's something that you've always sort of noticed and you were able to articulate. Yeah, well, the, I mean, it's the difference between proprietary and open source software, the difference between free software and non-free software. And that goes straight back to Richard Stallman. I mean, Richard Stallman is the great unrecognized genius of the computing revolution. Um, you know, I, I, the guy is an, an amazing person. Can, can I just say this, though, before you go on with him? Well, how about the software or maybe not the software but the language the communication language for example that is english which is pretty fucking dominant some people have easy access to it because they're born using it sometimes mm -hmm. in, in what might be described as good homes and they put in environments where it's just around them and they immersed in it and you know they, they get on with it other people let's say if you're born in the outskirts of manila um it doesn't come easily but you know it's still around you so you don't get to communicate in the global language like other people do. You know, mm -hmm. for example, say someone who was born in, you know, Nouveau Riche, northwest London. Mm -hmm. So um, providing that access for me is a little bit like what I feel you just said. You know, what you were just saying about why did they get to play the distributed game and not me? 
Um, mm. You know, maybe they would have that if they tried to learn Filipino, but they're not interested, so there, it doesn't matter. There's a be beautiful poem about um, uh, how the oppressors... Um, the oppressor's tongue becomes beloved by the oppressed. It's written by an Indian poet. I mean, it's on my blog. I can't remember her name, but it, it's just the most amazing, uh, most amazing poem. So it talks about um, great pan and it being a sin to kick a book um, and ha ha about gin and how the gin will come back to uh, haunt you if you do that. But how... Um, and I, I, seriously, I mean, is it, I, is, it, is, it, is it Rabindranath Tagore? Yes, I think so. I, I could find it in a minute on my, yeah, on my machine. It, it, and it, it's funny that you say that because I don't know if you remember. Do you remember the other day I said to you that I know that you enjoyed, you really enjoyed um, How to Lose Friends uh, mm. or whatever and alienate people? Yeah. Um, and then the other day I showed you that I'd come across this book by his dad. Not mm -hmm. the rise of the meritocratic society, but the metronomic society. Um, and at the beginning, Michael Young, who created which magazine, which was called the Consumers Association and Open University, and apparently wrote the Labour Party manifesto in 1945. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy, at the very beginning of the book, says that he went to school at Dartington, I think. Is it Dartington? Is that the name of the school? Um, a very kind of a very creative type of teaching and learning, but apparently it was set up by Rabindranath Tagore. Um, no, it won't be that. Then let let me find it so that I can give you the link. Uh, uh, um, uh, hold on. But yeah, no, I mean it's been a useful chat today, um, covering a fair few topics. Um, I interviewed Oswald Mosley's son, uh, grandson yesterday. Uh, and that's interesting because I was reading his book. I mean, I have to say, I thought of you a lot when I was reading his 2013 book that I've shown you called In the Name of the People, which is yeah. about democracy. Um, and I haven't read his new book, which is coming out in September, which is called Bank Robbery. And I just thought those two topics are exactly the topics that you do which is, um, what do you call it, decision-making in the political marketplace and um, credit creation. You know, those are the two topics. Anyway, and... Sujata Bhatt. Aha, uh -huh, okay. No, don't know. Um, oh, let me just... Uh... Any links would be most welcome. Here we go. Well, this is... Hold on. Right. Peace. There's more than one link in there. There's a wonderful Hungarian book written by a, a, a Hungarian Romani gypsy, uh, which okay. has never been published to my knowledge, but it should be. It's the most amazing book um, that I found online when I was researching my poem, uh, The Bards of Wales. Um, my friend Oshi thanked me a few days ago for sending him whatever you sent me about Osho. Oh, cool. Right. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing essay, that. Yeah. I only had a quick look at it, but I've got a friend called Oshi. So mm -hmm. I sent it to him because I thought, well, look, Oshi, you know, in, on another day, you might have been called Osho. Yeah. Um, and uh, he thanked me massively for sending it to him. I mean, I thought, well, look, mate, I'll be honest with you. I've intermediated without too much influence here. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, that was nice. He's got this idea about how he's a music promoter and he's noticed how there's all these news stories about people being stabbed in BBC, in the Daily Mail, in these other places. And then he said, but you know what? If you compare BBC One Extra and Capital One Extra, which is owned by uh, Ashley Tabor, whose father made his money from horses and betting shops, um, and owns LBC. He said, if you compare Capital One Extra and Radio One Extra and the normal pirate radio stations like Rinse FM, mm -hmm. then he reckons that the commercial and public radio stations have more violent lyrics 
in the music, music that they play than the pirate radio stations do because the pirate radio stations are mixing it all up with conscious stuff. So he's basically saying that there's a kind of ghettoization of the mind going on mm-hmm. where they're encouraging people to feel like they should be, you know, winner takes all. Uh, yeah, as I right. I mean, I, I suspected that. I mean, I, I love radio. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, I do listen to radio in the car i don't drive much these days or go out much really but but when i do in the car i do like often to put the radio on and listen to music but what i really miss is djs talking between songs introducing the tunes okay and also the tunes which get played but i think that modern drum beats in music really do um, break up thought patterns. They stop people from stringing thoughts together. That, that's my own view. And um, it, it's um, something I did a lot of messing about with, with was different tunings and frequencies of tunings. And I reproduced um, a really long article on my Steam It blog uh, talking about basically pitch inflation which is concert pitch is now 440 hertz whereas back in the sort of classical music and the baroque music period concert pitch was much lower it was um and apparently 432 hertz is a um a frequency which causes us to feel calm whereas 440 hertz um actually jars with our own uh, our own frequencies our own uh, you know rhythm of life if you will and you know there's a frequency that the world is at it's called whatever it's called um and these things are all really really important um and uh, i i think your friend is right um and you see at a local level it's it's a bit like the smith month act for um for uh, for, for radio in different areas, if people are listening to the local area and you want them to behave in a certain way, it would make sense to play music of a certain type at a certain tempo, at a certain pitch, even in a certain key, uh, because, um, you know, the modes of music, um, Plato uh, was for banning all but two of the modes of music. Did you know that? Uh, who, who said that? Who wanted to? Who, oh, Plato, right? Yeah. In the Republic, he he, he was going to ban uh, ban the flute. <laughs> uh, uh, certainly ban um, mine. Yeah, ban major keys. I think it was. Uh, but, but, but but in terms of the different modes and, and which modes work and don't work and all the rest of it, all cause different feelings, as it were. So I, I think your music promotion friend, Oshi, is absolutely correct. Yeah, and, you know, people use the word, you know, in politics, people talk about the, people use the term mood mood music, don't they? They say, what's the mood music? You know, and in financial services, in you know, on the media, they go, what's the mood music? And, you know, the Muzak and all of this the kind music, of stuff. Music, and then also being in a position, yeah. in a position where you are either willing to, you know how sometimes people say, you know, if you can't fuck it, then kill it. Then you know, like music that the music that puts you in either of those moods, mm. you know, yeah. will really buy it. Mm. No, I'm sure that's. Uh, uh, I think Oshi's on to something there. I, I agree with him. Now, shall I give you an opportunity to uh, regroup, continue what you're doing? But I'm really, really pleased that you know we have discussed in the past stuff to do with Grub Street and Alexandria. Mm-hmm. But also, I'm glad that I've told you a little bit about what some of my ideas are for the, um, like, sort of a mix of between board game and stuff like that, where the user experience for students is mm-hmm. kept high, where the pace is high. If you ever come across a f- open source version of Adobe Captivate, where you can do um, Q&A, because you know how, like, on Twitter you can do a poll? Yeah. Yeah. It needn't be that much more sophisticated than that, but also I want to do drag and drop, you know, where you can move words around. Yeah, so, so like a website builder, Weebly builder. There are game apps for doing that. I mean, I used to play with them a few years ago, so they already exist. Um, really? Uh, 
So uh, I'll have to look back in my notes because I was playing with those things about five years ago and it will have evolved um, since then. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, you know, let's... I mean, even in, 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 in uh, shooting, shoot-up games, the, the, the guy that invented Oculus has got a platform now where you can actually do a full-on, uh, you know, you can do a full-on video game about learning language if you want to. You can make one? Yeah. Yeah. Do you it's... have to be an advanced yeah. Oculus programmer? No, not at all. I mean, it's, it's, well, a little bit of would help. But 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 he, he's developed something so that it's more drag and drop, because the point is this, Ranjan, is the nerds might be able to program this, but they're not necessarily the best people to write the stories that people want to play on them or, or act out on them, which is why mm. you have, um, you know, well, that, that's why um, the skill sets that you find in game companies are not necessarily all the ones that you'd expect i mean i would love to be the poet in residence or the philosophy in residence at a games company for instance okay know? so how about this <laughs> how about this do you remember how i was talking about gerd gigerenza before gerd gigerenza yeah one of the things that he said was bayesian probability and decision trees if you think about things in terms of that then you've pretty much limited the outcomes to you know in, if you have a sort of finite set of circumstances and possibilities in a sort of world then you've roughly limited it to them and if you show a decision tree of options to a child and give yeah. them the relative probabilities then they understand things very quickly and you can't play them around as bankers often do with their clients mm. you know to do with to do with you know mis-selling and stuff like that so I, yeah so, it, it so for me down, what comes down to credulity really um and manipulation yeah, so what I'm thinking is, based on what you just said, do you remember Dungeons and Dragons and all those kinds of things where you have an option? You know, mm -hmm. you, you read a blurb and then they say, now, what do you do? A or B, A or B, A or B, A or B. Mm -hmm. So if we had a set of decision trees that had a little video that accompanied every decision, then for language learning, they would have the agency of always being awake, always making decisions, preferably using their their conscious mm. brains but i'll settle for subconscious mm. i mean press a button that's enough but then every time they do it they would be forced to listen to a little very very little bit of a story or a little mm. bit of blurb and then afterwards they'll have a little drag and drop exercise mm. and then they're right or wrong until they get it right and then they choose where to go next then yeah. they will feel like there's a risk attached to the game that there's an outcome that's not determined where they feel mm. like they make a difference. You're selling them agency uh, and you're getting all the buy-in necessary. And incidentally, they'll learn the language. Mm. You know, they'll, they'll learn how to instinctively deprogram themselves from the normal combinations that they would use from their mother tongue and start employing and being attracted to the new ones because they need to do yeah. that in order to get the cheese on the other side of the corridor. Yeah. Um, I mean, on a bump sticker it's kind of uh, a bumper sticker it's make learning interesting again or make learning relevant again or something you know well what do you think of that then i mean just now what we've outlined there you know would be a case of you know humans are addicted to stories they're addicted to narrative and they mm -hmm. like the idea of you know if they get into it they like the idea of choosing where it goes you know like scooby-doo alternative endings mm. um so in a way, by doing a bit of story, like you said, if you combine geek with storyteller, you mm. do a bit of- Help me! If you do, if you do a bit of um, storytelling and then um, give them a choice, an mm -hmm. exercise and a choice, and a bit more storytelling and a bit more exercise and choice, mm. then that might work. Yeah. And from yeah. what you said, the um, the ability to do that is very much here now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. OK. Well, look, I'll leave you guys to your day. Um, and uh, yeah, cool. Lots to think about. OK, thanks a lot. See you All soon. Right. Cheers, Bye. Bye.
バイ。